Jesus was a student of Sam Hitler, and he was a, a terrific uh, influence in his career. So the title of his talk is Topological Complexity and General Lives of Environments. Thank you very much. Thank you very much uh, for the invitation, and uh, it's a great pleasure and honor to be here, uh, remembering our good friend uh, Sam. And as Miguel uh, mentioned, um, I was a student of, of, of uh, Samuel. It was a very nice experience being in Rochester when uh, uh, I finished my I, uh, undergrads. Uh, I got in touch with uh, Samuel, and uh, he took me to Rochester. It was a great experience being there and just uh, making sure that uh, life is very good, especially when you have a good friend and a good advisor uh, on, on the reach of your hand. So we all miss him a lot, but uh, we're very really happy to, to be here remind, reminding him. Okay, so I'm going to be talking about uh, these things uh, related to topological complexity. There are uh, some uh, ideas that I've been working on for some time now, and this time I want to uh, say a few uh, words about its relationship to uh, a certain um, form of obstruction theory under the name of Hoff invariants. Hoff invariants are a very classical uh, topic in, in homotopy theory, and of course they show up in the, topolo on, in the homotopical point of view of uh, topological complexity. So let me just uh, say that this is a joint work with uh, two collaborators of mine, Mark Grant in Aberdeen and Lucille Vandenbroek in Portugal, in Braga. Yeah. Okay, so the talk is divided in three main uh, uh, pieces. The first one is presenting the, the main ideas and results. Then I wanna, uh, this is going to be a rather theoretical, very nice to, to say. Um, then I'm going to be uh, saying a little bit more of how um, the theory works, and uh, depending on time, uh, I will, at the end, I will be d uh, discussing some of the fine uh, ideas behind these uh, things. Okay, so what's uh, the main uh, topic here? It's uh, topological complexity, which is a concept that was introduced about 20 years ago by Michael Farber, and it has to do with uh, having a topological model for the motion planning problem in robotics. Okay, so what's uh, the idea here? Uh, the idea is that uh, you have a space X, which is supposed to be the, the space of states of some mechanical system. And that, um, well, you can take this vibration, the double evaluation map that goes from the space of three paths on X down to X times X. And, um, well, this is a nice vibration, this is a classical vibration. And then, um, well, the map, of course, what is the map? The map sends a uh, given path gamma into its initial and final positions. Um, so what's the motivation for this, uh, for caring about taking a look at this uh, vibration? It comes from robotics, as um, Faber uh, was, uh, had the idea here, is that, well, you have here the double evaluation map, so suppose X is, as I said, is the space of states of some robot. Then the Cartesian product can be thought of as the uh, space of tasks of this robot, motion tasks. Namely, you have a pair of initial and final position of this robot. And then the, the path space, the free path space, can be thought of as the space of solutions for this robot then um, a section for this uh, vibration would be a motion planner, namely a rule that assigns to each task, each movement task, a, co uh, and a concrete uh, path solving the task, namely a path starting at the initial point and uh, ending at the initial point. Well, it turns out that uh, this is a very simple idea. Uh, if you want to stay still in the apply world, well, you would have to say that this, what, what is a special uh, condition that you will require in such a much, uh, planning, uh, motion, uh, in, in such a motion planner, in, in such a section. Well, what you want to do for this session to do is that it has to be continuous. We have to stay in the topological category, but not because we like topology, but because we want this motion planner to be robust to noise 
Namely, if you have, if, you, if this robot is performing in a noisy environment and uh, the robot receives a signal that is a little bit perturbed from the, 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 the signal that we really wanted the robot to, to perform, then we don't want, even for small perturbations, we don't want the robot to, to make a completely different solution of, of the task. So we want continuous sections. Uh, unfortunately, having a global continuous section for this vibration is equivalent for the space being contractible. And in practice, robots do not have contractible uh, space of states. So what's the next thing that you could do? Well, you could uh, uh, define the topological complexity of this, of this configuration space, of this in general, this space, to be the sectional category of this vibration. We mean not to worry about having or not a, a global section, continuous section, but what's the minimum number of open sets in which you can partition the, the, um, the task space so that in each one of these uh, open sets, the robot admits a, 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 a continuous, robust noise motion planner. And that would be precisely the section category, which is defined then uh, to be the topological complexity of this space. So topological complexity at the end is measuring the complexity of motion planning a robot that is performing in a noisy environment. Okay, now this is really, well, this is classical, just because of the motivation, it, you could say is new, 20 years old, but the, the same idea you can do it for many kinds of vibrations, of course, and one of the most classical ones is this vibration. Now, when you look at the space of a uh, base path, it's not three paths. It, these paths are based at a, at a, uh, start in a given fixed point, and then they go anywhere they want. And now we could uh, evaluate such a map into its final point. Notice that this space is contractible, so having a local section would just be having a, an open set of the base page, which is deformable in the space to a point. And by definition, that's but that's one equivalent, equivalent for nice, space, uh, nice spaces. This is equivalent to the classical definition of the Luston and Schinemann category of X. Uh, category of X. Okay, now category of X is uh, then a close relative to topological, of topological complexity. And indeed, it shares many properties and methods to, to, to study these uh, things. For instance, for one thing, if uh, you pull back this double evaluation map under this uh, section, you would uh, uh, obviously recover the, uh, this vibration. So in a sense, this tells you that the topological complexity of a space bound, is bounded from below by the category, the classical LS category of the space X. And also that, uh, of course, the, the, the genus of any vibration will be bounded uh, from above by the, um, the category of the Cartesian product, which is roughly uh, two times the category of X. Now, well, topological complexity is in between these two numbers, but in, in a sense it's more flexible than category because, well, here's one thing that I uh, learned from Dan Cohen. From, from a, uh, he, he was lecturing on this on 2013. And it says, well, suppose you take two numbers, C and T, little, uh, little C and little T, and they are satisfying this inequality. Then there is always a space whose category is Z, C, what? Sorry. And there is always a space whose category is C and whose topological complexity is T. In other words, TC, topological complexity, can distinguish among many uh, spaces for which category would not be able to distinguish from. But there are, of course, other more uh, kind of uh, comparisons that one can do. Both are homotopy invariants, that's good. We are homotopy theorists, so we like these kind of things. But uh, as I was saying, to topological complexity is less rigid. For instance, it's quite easy to see that the category of a sphere is one, whereas the category of the, sorry, the topological complexity of spheres is either one or two, depending on the parity of the dimension of the, of the dimension of the sphere. So somehow there's something going on here, and what I want to do at the end of the talk, well, by the end of the talk, is to give an explanation which is homotopy nature. This naturally homotopic explanation of this fact, which was uh, already known 
from the beginning, from the initial work uh, by Michael Farber. Anyhow, one of the properties that got, caught my eye on these kind of problems is the following fact. Suppose you consider the real projective space of dimension M, RPM. Then it is standard and very easy to see that the category of this uh, space is M, the dimension of the, of the space. However, the topological complexity of this space is actually the same as the immersion dimension of this manifold. Namely, the minimal, the, the Euclidean immersion dimension, namely the, the, the minimal, the dimension of the smallest possible Euclidean space where this manifold admits an immersion. And this is for all, all except for the three special cases where you have a uh, H space structure on these uh, spaces. And there is also a homotopy, of course, there is a, a homotopy explanation of this fact that I might be able to, to say at the end. And there are many other properties relating versions of TC with versions of the immersion problem, namely the embedding problem for these manifolds. All right. So, well, what is the point <coughs> with uh, all this? Uh, I want to do a little bit of obstruction theory. And I want to do to, to generalize or modify uh, ideas coming from obstruction theory to understand what uh, this problem is. So let me just make a little change of gears for this talk and talk of a slightly different uh, ideas, namely the Ganea conjecture. Ganea conjecture is a, uh, was, is, is a really well known a conjecture, but I'm going to be saying here what it is about. It is already known what the answer is. And it basically says, well, it's quite easy to see that the category is uh, sub-additive. The category of a Cartesian product is bounded from above by the sum of the categories of the factors. That's OK. And you don't have to do, go very far to find examples of x and, e and y, so that this is, an strict, this is a strict inequality. But for instance, uh, to get these examples, you can take more spaces of different of prime of relative prime torsions. So that's quite easy to see that uh, in that case you have a strict inequality. But uh, suppose that you stay in spaces that are closer to each other, at least in homologically or homotopically, then uh, well, you could say, would it be true that it, this is always be this is always a, an, an equality? And uh, well, suppose one of the factors is very simple, unquote, a sphere. Sphere is torsion free, homologically. And uh, well, the category would increase at most by one by after uh, crossing with a sphere. So, Ganea conjecture, after doing, again, the conjecture says that uh, if you start looking here and there for uh, well known spaces, you will realize that usually the, the category of the Cartesian product is the sum. But uh, so that was the, the, the conjecture. Um, more or less uh, recently, again, a little bit more than 20 years ago, Nori Wasi showed that the conjecture is false. You can actually produce spaces which are not perhaps very common in nature, for which you have a strict inequality for uh, this uh, Ghanaian conjecture. Uh, Wasi's examples are somehow easy to understand. These are two cell complexes, although the attaching maps are a bit mysterious because you have to dig in more or less deep in the homotopy groups of spheres to find these kind of examples. But it's uh, okay, that's uh, the answer. Now, what, what is going on with topological complexity? Topologic asks the same questions for topological complexity, namely, it is sub additive. You can find uh, counter examples to, sorry, you can find uh, examples where this is a strict inequality. And in particular, for spheres, if you cross a space with a sphere, topological complexity would increase now at most by two, but if you're crossing with an odd dimensional sphere, it would only increase by at most by one. And the question is, well, most likely it will not be an, an equality in general. And indeed, here's uh, one, um, well, you could say more or less minor result that you can derive from these uh, the ideas that I'm gonna be presenting. Uh, this is uh, with these uh, guys. So suppose you start with this space. This is a stunted real projective space, which is one of the spaces that grew on my heart when I was a uh, PhD student. Uh, so this is a, a stunted real projective space. Take P6 and not out to a point, 
a P2, a copy of the, the, the P2 that is as a subcomplex of this space, and take the wedge sum of this space with itself, then it is not quite, it, it is more or less easy to see the topological complexity of TC of, of X is four. However, if you look at the topological complexity of that space, crossed with an even sphere, it does not go up by one. It only goes up by, sorry, it does not go up by two, as this would say. It actually goes up only by one, and it really goes up by one. So, well, this kind of ideas, uh, this, this type of result is just the tip of the iceberg that uh, is uh, underneath everything. Namely, you need to understand a little bit more of homotopy theory to be able to say what is going on in general. For instance, it would be very interesting to, 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 to have an example where the topological complexity of a space does not go up at all after a crossing with any uh, dimensional, any sphere. Anyway, this is, a, this is a, I, I didn't say, this is a copy. Now, it was not my, my daughter that got the, the hand in this picture. Uh, no, it's, this is supposed to be a picture of this space under the eyes of the Matus steroid algebra. Anyway, um, okay, so, well, that's the general conjecture uh, for TC. And, well, what has, what has to do, what does these TC ideas have to do with obstruction theory? Well, it is a standard that if you have, in general, a vibration, like the double evaluation map, if you have a vibration, then you can always form the fiber-wise joint of this vibration with itself. Namely, you are just taking the joints of uh, fibers among points on, on a common fiber. So, in other words, this space is a space of simplices with vertices in a common fiber. And but of course, you're varying the fiber. And a very standard uh, fact about this construction is that uh, the uh, sectional category of this vibration is at most n, namely it has n plus one local open sets, each one with a, a, a local section, if and only if, for this n, when you look the nth iterated uh, join, fiber rest join of P with itself, it admits a global section. So in other words, if you want to say, well, this is bounded from some number, what you have to do is section some given uh, vibration, namely a fiber rest uh, construction of, of the original one. And of course, uh, this, has, this can be um, addressed with the use of obstruction theory. Obstruction theory works very nice when you have, precisely when you have want to section a vibration defined over a base space, which is a CW complex. You're trying to lift a section, uh, to extend a section over the skeleton. Well, uh, here's, uh, here's um, where, here. I should have said that uh, an example of this construction is precisely uh, the Ghanaian, the nth Ghanaian vibration, for, and that is precisely uh, uh, obtained when you start with the vibration defining category of, uh, of a space, and you just start uh, doing this viral-wise construction. Uh, another way of constructing this Ghanaian vibration is by a uh, fiber cone construction. You take the fiber and then they take the cone and you iterate it and you, by definition you get the, uh, the Ghanaian vibration. Okay, well, so you, can, you could do obstruction theory to try to estimate values or understand the properties, the global properties of this topological complexity um, thing. But of course, doing obstruction theory is not a, such a pleasant thing because it is usually very complicated. Namely, to, to start with, you have to deal with uh, in indeterminacy. Namely, you start to, you, you need to, you might need to be able to, to define sections and all of a sudden you realize that you cannot extend it any longer. Maybe you have to go back to a smaller uh, skeleton and start all over again and maybe you have to run all the possibly trees. And that's really awful because it's not because of the length of the work that you have to do because this is not an algorithmic way of, of doing it. You really have to do some, be lucky or have very good ideas on how to deal with, uh, with um, higher invariants. And here's another thing which I want to use to motivate the model, the variation that I want to introduce here, 
um, for the, the Hoff invariance uh, approach. Namely, well, to begin with, there is no indication on what end to try here for using obstruction theory. Namely, okay, you would say, uh, let's try n equals 15, and then start doing obstruction theory, and all of a sudden, after a couple of months or years, and you, just, you realize that, ah, uh, okay, I could solve the problem, but 15 was not the right answer. Maybe it's smaller. So you don't want to go 14 and 13 or whatever. So I would like to have a, a better way to decide the end to try with. So, and the, the solution is going to come from some kind of modified obstruction theory. And this is a point that I really enjoy mentioning at this moment, because at the early stages on, uh, of his career, uh, Sam had this beautiful idea of modifying classical obstruction theory for applying precisely to the immersion problem of real projective spaces. And essentially what you do is, instead of solving uh, decomposing a vibration uh, in terms of the, the classical Posnikov mu Posnikov tower, where you introduce one homotopic group at a time, what you do is you introduce all the groups at the time, but only elements of a given atoms filtration. And this has the, the advantage that, well, the first term in the, uh, in the cell spectral sequence, in the world in for say suppose you're doing the Adam spectral sequence, sorry, the Adam spectral sequence, the first term, term is um, computable in terms of homological algebra and essentially you explore the, those, the data accessibility of the theory to get a hold or a good hold on the obstructions, even the higher level of structure. And this is a very nice idea and with this idea uh, Sam and Mark Mahowell and many, many guys we uh, were able to actually say some words about uh, the immersion dimension of real projective spaces. But let me just remark that, after all, what they were doing was, well, if you change a little bit your, your taste, uh, they were doing robotics in real projective spaces. So let me uh, mo try to introduce a different kind of uh, mod modification of, of structure theory. This is not a, a completely original idea. It really does exist for, say, LS category, but I'm just trying to, to implement it and adapt it to TC. Okay, so here's a model. Here's a result by Burston, Hilton, and Whitehead uh, on the use of Hoff invariants. Hoff invariants are really very old, maybe from the 40s, 50s, uh, construction in homotopy theory, and a little bit later, uh, they realize that it has to do with uh, category. Namely, suppose you have a space whose category is known somehow, but then you have to attach a single cell to this space. What happens to the category of, the, uh, of this space after attaching a cell? Well, after all, you are attaching only a cone. So the category increases at most by one. That's quite easy to see. But the point is that this is an, uh, an equality if and only if certain obstruction happens. It's non-trivial. And this is precisely the Hoff invariant associated to the uh, attaching map. So this is, this is the idea. So let me just be a little bit more specific in how these things work. But anyway, um, if you already know these kind of results, then here's a, a strategy to try to compute the category of a space. Namely, you start computing the category of the skeleton, you decide what the category of the, of the, of the one skeleton is, that which should not be very complicated, and then attach the next cells. It would only increase by one, at most by one, and decide what, what it does, and so on and so forth. The problem with this is, all of a sudden, if you might be already doing a lot of work for computing this category, and then when you attach the, the next round of cells, the category would go to the floor. Might actually be a contractible space if you attach a final cell. So you don't want this kind of uh, wasting effort uh, business. So again, this has to do with the other motivation that I was uh, doing. So uh, the goal is to introduce a slightly modified version of this that avo avoids this kind of uh, wasting efforts uh, problem. And not only that it generalizes to category, but, sorry, that it applies to category, but it generalizes to TC or in general to any vibration. 
So, uh, well, as I was saying, this is, the, this is not my work. This is uh, well known. This is work by these guys. Here's how it works. So let me define, let me recall for you what the Huff invariant is for a given map from uh, two spheres, SQ down to SP. What's the Huff invariant of such a thing? Well, the Huff invariant, by definition, or one way to say it, is this is just the obstruction for this map to be compatible with the co-h space structure of the spheres. So, technically, it is a map from the domain of this map, SQ, into the joint square of the loops on SP with itself. Okay, so it's, that's just the obstruction for this map to preserve the co-multiplication. Okay, of course, notice that when Q is 2P minus 1, then this would, be, this would have a bottom cell in dimension precisely 2. And the Hoff invariant would just be a number, the degree, and you would recover the classical definition of the Hoff invariant. So what is this, what is the actual definition? So let me use this uh, thing. So look at this small triangle here. Uh, here. Look at this small triangle. This triangle is what you would be using if you want to say that this map preserves the co-multiplication, namely you apply the map and then co-multiply, or first co-multiply in the domain and then apply the map. All right, so this goes to here. Now notice that this, this doesn't have to be com uh, commutative um, uh, up to homotopy, not, not even up to homotopy because the map in general would not have to be compatible with that structure. But notice that if you include this uh, wedge sum into the coefficient product, then the two maps become the same. This is just, if you co-multiply inclusion in, into the Cartesian product, by definition, this is just the diagonal up to homotopy, and the same thing here. So the two, two maps here would be the same down in the, fi in, in the base space. Now, the homo is well known that the homotopy fiber of this uh, inclusion is what is this map where this abstraction has to land. So this is just the, the join of the loop of SP with itself. And I have two maps. Then I can take the difference, say I use this structure for take the difference, the difference map to zero, and then it comes from here. Not only it comes from there, but it comes from a unique class because this vibration splits after one suspension. So this is injective. So the difference is, is really a map going to, the, um, to this uh, homotopy fiber, and that's precisely this map. It really captures, well, by definition it captures, it's the obstruction for this map alpha uh, to be a courage space map. All right, so that's, that's the definition. Now here's a slightly more organized way of, pre of presenting this construction. Namely, look at this uh, prism, this commutative prism. Well, this small triangle where I started from is on this slanted is floor here. This is moving to this slanted floor this thing that goes inclined. So what I'm doing is co-multiplication and then sum or the map and co-multiplication. That doesn't have to be commutative. Nevertheless, uh, it maps into here and I can pull it down uh, to the base. I push it down to the, to, the, to the base. Now notice that I keep the, the, the uh, Whitehead's idea is for constructing a Hoff invariant is you don't have to work with this space, namely what you can with this vibration. Namely, you can just pull back this vibration under the, the, the diagonal. If you do that, well, by definition, there is another, this is another way to construct the first Ganea vibration. Namely, you have this map from the suspension loops of SP down to SP. This is a map that Fred, Fred was uh, mentioned it, uh, in his talk. Uh, this is just a valuation map. This is a sort of adjoint or co-adjoint to, to the identity of the loop space on, on, on SP. And notice that this map has a canonical section, namely the space decomposes as a wedge of spheres and the bottom cell, the bottom sphere, is precisely SP and that gives you the, the, the section. So th this guy has a canonical section and because this is a pullback, it shares the same vibration, it's the same fiber, sorry, the same fiber. All right, so I can just take this vibration, pull it down under the diagonal, and produce the first Ganea vibration. 
All right, but now what I've done really is, uh, well, I didn't, oh yes, I said it, but the, the pullback of this co-multiplication turns out to be this section, the canonical section. So this, is, this composite, namely this red map followed by the yellow one, already is uh, happening in, in the red uh, part, in the black back part of this uh, prism, namely it's this map. But I can do the same thing for the other component, namely this one composed with this one, namely I can pull it this here, it pulls to the, with the can canonical section and then this construction is functorial, so I have here the suspension of, on, of loops of, of alpha, and then, well, the difference for the, the problem for this square to be commutative, which is a map from here into here, would be just the same as the problem for this square being commutative, namely this composite being this composite, and that's just a map from here to the fiber, to the fiber of this guy, from here to here. But these are the same fibers, so it's the same obstruction. So this is a very nice way to, of presenting the uh, Hoff invariant for a map. And let me just summarize everything that I've described up to this moment, namely, what's the Hoff invariant of a map between two, two spheres? alpha. Well, you take the first Ganea vibration, take the fiber, take the canonical sections, notice that the, this uh, square is not commutative, this is not compatible maybe with this because alpha might not be a homotopy uh, uh, co-h uh, space map. And then the difference would be just a map from here into to the fiber of the first Ganea vibration. Why to take it? So that's the definition. Now, the question is, well, what's so special about this sphere and the first Ghanaian vibration? Well, what, what is so special is that uh, the category of the sphere is, of course, one, and this is the reason why you're taking first Ghanaian vibration. But now, suppose I want to present this in a more general way. So here is Iguaz's, um, this is basically Iguaz's uh, interpretation, understanding of, of these things, and the way that he used to, to construct this counterexample to the Ghanaia conjecture. Now, suppose you have any, any even map from S n minus 1 into X, you are attaching an n minus 1, uh, an n minus 1 sphere, well, you're producing an n uh, cell, and an, uh, you're attaching an n cell on X. And then you can do the same thing. Well, you can take the K, where K is the category, the category of X, you can take the K, Ghanaia vibration, it admits a section, because precisely where the theorem that I mentioned, namely, category is, is bounded from something if and only if this Ghanaia, iterated Ghanaia vibration admits a section, so it, it admits a section. And then you can compare it with the corresponding Ghanaia vibration for the sphere, consider this square, which is commutative, going down, like that, because the construction is functorial. This one has a canonical section, but the, this map may not be this map, just because of the same reasons that happen in the sphere, in the case of spheres. So what you could say what's the difference, and the difference is naturally a map from the space into the fiber of the Ghanaian vibration. All right, so that's what I want to define as the Hoff invariant of this attaching map for attaching a n cell to X. All right, now there are several problems. Unlike this X section, this is really unique. This is a canonical one, essentially because the sphere behaves very well. But in this case, it doesn't have to be a canonical section. There are, might be a lot. So, well, what you have to do is take all of them, take all of them, take all possible uh, liftings, and consider the corresponding maps from here to here. Here. So you have a set of homotopy classes. Let me, uh, li I, I like to call these the hop set for obstructions, for uh, understanding the category of X with this cell attached, with an extra cell attached. And the theorem here basically says, well, okay, the category would increase at most by one, but it would not increase if and only if this half set is trivial. Trivial in the sense that it contains the trivial homotopy class. All right, so this is basically this uh, theorem of uh, these three guys. So, the, well, notice that this is a set, and you have to deal not like if it were not enough dealing with homotopy classes, you have to deal with a homotopy set of classes. Oh, sorry, with a set of homotopy classes. Anyway, well, this reflects that still that even in this uh, sense, 
you really have to deal with indeterminacy. There are sets. Some of them may be good, some of them may not, and you have to look for the right one to, to have a conclusive, uh, some conclusion that you want to draw. Okay, so let me make now, what we did is make a small modification of this setting to produce generalized Hoff is sets associated to any kind of uh, fibrosion. Not only the evaluation, the, the single evaluation map defining LS category. So here's basically what you can do. Suppose you have a fibrosion E down into B. I have this fibrosion P and I have a, any, any old map phi from X into B. And let me define the category, the sexual category of this vibration relative to this map simply as the sectional category of the pullback. So I, I have this vibration, I can pull it back over here under phi. I have a new vibration and I look at the sectional category of that thing. Well, sectional category does not increase, cannot increase upon taking pullbacks. So essentially, you get that the relative section of the category is bounded from above by the regular, yeah, the relative is bounded from above by the regular section of the category. That's very good, but then, under certain conditions, not only the, the, section of the, the, the relative section of the category bounds from below, but it also bounds from above at most by, with, a, with a possible gap. Then we suppose that this map is just the inclusion of uh, its just inclusion of, of the cone of another map. Namely, suppose that this is a space which is obtained from X by attaching a cone. You can attach a cell, that would be a cone, but you can attach a cone on anything. If that is so, it's not difficult again to see that sectional category has to be somewhere in between the, sectional, the relative sectional category and one more. If it increases, it increases most by one, but it does not decrease at all. So this solves, this is going to be the responsible for this, uh, avoiding this uh, wasting effort issue. Because it will not, what you're doing is good enough and then you just have to keep doing computations. So once, uh, once you know, all right, this is, this is quite easy. This is elementary to see, but you have to do it in the right way in order to decide, okay, and now tell me, whether section of category is the relative one or is one more. If I had a way to decide this, then I could implement this strategy to, to understand the section of category of any, any old vibration. Then we take your vibration and suppose you decompose this space, the base space, into a, a, a sequence of cones. You have a cone decomposition. Namely, you start with a point. Attach a cone, where you have a, a suspension. That's nice, but then start in attaching more cones and another cone and so on until you get to B. You're attaching cones. You might be attaching cells, but it doesn't have to be. It doesn't have to be, it, they might be cells, but they not, may, may not be of all of the same dimension. And then, well, you just start applying this result, namely, section of category of a point is obviously zero because you have an obvious section, but every time you increase if you attach a next cone, the section and category would increase at most by one, and it would not go down, and so on. And you have to decide, and you have to do this throughout the whole decomposition. And you need to have this way of deciding whether the section and category stays or increases exactly by one. And of course, this is uh, the, the theorem, the main theorem. Really, what I just described is a recursive setting for understanding the, the sectional category of a vibration when you understand what it happens to the space X, which is uh, giving rise to B after attaching a cone. So suppose you have this vibration, suppose you have this co-vibration, and then suppose that the pullback of this vibration on X, namely the rest, suppose it is an inclusion, I can always represent it up to homotopy by inclusion. Suppose I pull back this into here, so I'm looking at the relative section of the category, and suppose I know that. I know that this is, this is n. Okay, then I could look at the n fiberwise joint of P with itself over P. And if I restrict it to, to X, because this is a functorial construction, I know it admits a section, because I suppose it. So, this, in other words, this vibration, 
has a lift, uh, well, this map lifts through this vibration. And then, just because of the same reason for hot invariance, well, this map, this composite alpha followed by S, maps down trivially, because it would have a, this, uh, the, the composition in this co-fibration, and therefore this guy factors through the fiber, and again, this is split after a one uh, looping, after looping once, and that gives you essentially an, uh, a homotopy class, HS, that depends only on the section that you choose to begin with. And well, this is a little bit technical, but if S is a suspension and you're with a large enough N, then not only HS uh, depends uniquely on S because it's an inclusion in homotopy, but, but this map would be trivial, homotopically trivial, of course, if and only if this composite is trivial. And of course, well, then you have to work a little bit, if and only if S admits a lifting extends to a section of the original vibration. So this way, this is basically the, what is go, happening with the obstruction shell theory. You, you start trying to extend things, but now I'm attaching cones, not regular cells. So we can do the same definition. We can define the half set relative to the, fibr to the vibration under consideration to be the set of these homotopy classes as you run through these partial liftings. This is the p half set for this vibration, and the elements are the associated p half invariants. And the theorem is what I was, uh, the, the, the desired result, namely, in the setting above, sectional category would be in between the relative one and one more. And not only that, you would say that it does not increase if and only if this half set vanishes. If and only if it admits, it, it has a null homotopy class. So this is, what's the driving philosophy? Well, this seems to be nothing new under the sun. Uh, you're doing obstruction in a crude way. So that should be very complicated. However, one thing that you're uh, uh, having, gaining, you have with this one advantage, is that you're avoided this uh, wasting effort issue, because what I said. But not only that, in many cases where a regular obstruction theory would fail because you have to deal with a lot of indeterminacy, in many of those cases, these half sets can be estimated, can be computed just by homological, singular, plain, regular, stupid homot homological computations. So that's one very thing, the good thing. And not only that, here's a very a concrete way of seeing that this is indeed the case. When you compute, when, if you want to define and then see what's the half invariant of a map from a sphere, do we have chalk? Ah, here. From S2P minus one into S2P, what's the half invariant of such a map? Well, there is a very naive way of doing it. Just take the cone, it has a two cell complex, it has a cohomology class in dimension P, another in dimension 2P, and look at the, 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 the cup square, and how many times this cup, uh, cup square is of the other generator, and that number is it. So? Thank you very much. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, and uh, yeah, otherwise it would be on topic. <laughs> uh, and, uh, the, um, and this number would be just the half invariant. The, the, the half invariant, the number, this, this number. So homologically, or in this case, cohomologically, you can compute, if you want, if you want it, half invariants. And this is uh, basically the same driving philosophy here. And it does indeed work for many cases, and in particular, this can give you a uh, homotopy explanation of a very simple fact that Farber himself knew. Namely, the topological complexity of a sphere is either one or two. This is more or less easy to see. It's not very complicated. That's, but it depends on the parity. But underneath of this uh, naive computation, there is a not so naive homotopy fact. Namely, the Hoff invariant of the Whitehead square of the identity 
is sometimes zero and sometimes it is not zero. Actually, it's two. And it happens depending on the parity of the sphere. And that's what is going on behind that fact. And here's a, a, the, the explanation for this. Of course, this is in terms of homotopy invariance, uh, sorry, of Hoff invariance, and uh, this, is, this is designed to detect this, this problem. So suppose I want to understand the topological complexity of the sphere Sn. So I want to understand the sexual category of this double evaluation map for Sn. Well, there is a very efficient con decomposition of this, of this space. Namely, you start with a point, then you attach the axis, and then you attach the top cell. This is the regular, it is really the, the cellular decomposition of this thing. It's a con decomposition, it's just a regular thing. The topology, the, the sectional category of this thing over here is zero. Of this thing over here increases at most by one, and it actually increases by one because, well, because of what I already said. If you restrict this over here and then restrict it to one of the axes, you recover the, category, the, the LS category, and that is one. And it cannot, if it was zero over here, it would have to be zero on the sphere. It is not. So here you already know that there is a, a non-trivial homotopy Hoff invariant. And then you want to decide what happens to this Hoff set that I just described when, in these terms. So, well, the recipe was very straightforward. You look at, you know this vibration, but well, you have your original vibration over, over this cone decomposition. By the way, this is the attaching map of the last uh, cell. And you already know that this vibration has a um, section and category over here, which means you have a section. All right, but now, look at this space. This map is highly connective, because the fiber is highly connective with respect to this dimension. So the lifting is unique. So the half set is not a set. It's a half invariant. Well, that's not very new. And then this is the half invariant. What is the half invariant? We already know, because by some other reason, very simple, that the half invariant is not zero if and only n is even. But I would like to be able to compute it or say something about it. And well, indeed, this TC half set, the, uh, basically this map, is nothing but, by definition, is a Hoff invariant. And by comparing it to the cone of the diagonal, you can see that this Hoff set is nothing, well, it has to be a map like that, but it's nothing but, but what I said, is the, the Hoff invariant of the whitehead product. And that's not a big surprise because the attaching map is a whitehead product. So, well, that's fine. Not only is zero sometimes and non-zero sometimes, it is two, some of those other non-times. And how, do, how can you compute this? Well, this seems to be a, a quite intimidating thing to say, OK, the, the half invariant of this whitehead square is 2. Mm, how do you compute that? Homologically. That can actually be computed homologically. And this is another reason how this, is, uh, how this works. How much time do I have left? Um, like 10 minutes. Sir? 10 minutes. Well, I will. Well, I might be ending the first part of the talk, and then that might be just good enough. But let's see how we're doing in time. So here's, well, not, let's not play with the topological complexity of spheres, which is nicely answered in, term, in these terms. But suppose I, am, I want to understand what is the topological complexity of the next more difficult, homotopically, homotopically speaking, space, namely two cell complexes. So both, uh, what's the answer? What's the topological complexity of a two-cell complex? Of course, it has more inf uh, homotopy information. What's the attaching map? Um, if you want to do obstruction theory in the classical sense, you would really very fast go into problems here because the difference between the bottom the cell dimension and the top dimension is huge. And you have to go through a lot of uh, indeterminacy processes. So it would, it would have to be, uh, be a nightmare understanding homotop classical, homotop uh, cl uh, classical obstruction theory. But from this point of view, it's more simple. And actually, here's w one, an example where you are actually dealing with not with the, uh, the cell structure, the composition, but with a more efficient one, cone decomposition. And here's a picture of a, X has two cells. One in, well, has three cells, really. Base point p-dimensional cell, and q plus one-dimensional cell. Three cells. And actually, here's a copy of x. And this is supposed to be x times x. 
here is one axis, here is another, this is a con the, the cell de cellular decomposition of X of the, other, of the other factor, and this is just the product cell decomposition of a X of this double two cell complex with respect to that. Okay, so for instance, you have the base point, and then in the next level, you have to attach the first the two D cell for each factor. So the first, uh, after attaching these two things, you get this wedge sum. And then you have to make a choice. Depending on the dimension of this cell, with respect to the dimension of these two cells, you would first attach one or the other. But notice that this cell attaches over this part, whereas this cell attaches only on, on this part. So these three cells can be attached all, of a, all, all at the same time, at the same, at the same time. So, and I'll do it, because I am saving some work with respect to indeterminacy. And then the rest of the construction, the construction, the cells are just what you would do cellularly. So here's a description of the spaces that you get in this uh, filtration. And in each, in each step, you would have a, a half set, which I have already described. Namely, you know that the section category of this double evaluation map is zero over here, and it will increase at most by one when you go up to here, depending on what this half set is, whether it is trivial or not, and so on and so forth. You have four levels, four cones that you are attaching, and consequently you have four half sets to deal with. Well, the short answer is that all these half sets can be described. And not only that, in almost all cases, no, not in all cases, yeah, I would be very happy if that would be the case, but when they can be described, which is in the metastable range, I would say just a little bit about that, it is always a version of the classical Hof invariant of alpha, maybe the Hof set for the single evaluation map. So the theorem with these guys is that, well, the first invariant, the first obstruction is non-zero. That's kind of ridiculous, I already said so. That's non-zero, uh, that, this one. So the, the relative topological complexity on this level is actually one, it does go up by one. Now the second one actually is the same as a homotopy class, as, the, this is a, a singleton, it's not a set, as the classical half invariant of alpha. And, well, homotopy theorists theory here would know how to do, to deal, to compute that. So, okay, the second one is classical. What happens from that point on, mainly there are two more obstructions remaining to be understood, is, okay, suppose it happens on, on what happens, it depends on what happens with uh, this obstruction, whether this is trivial or not. If this is trivial, well, we know that the category of X of these two cell complexes is one. It didn't increase to two. It's, it stays being one. And the topological complexity would have to be at most two because of the initial uh, uh, estimate that I already mentioned at the beginning. But it cannot be two because a two cell complex cannot be an even sphere, an odd dimensional sphere, and there is a well known theorem that spaces with TZ being one are precisely homotopy equivalent to all dimensional spheres. So it has to be, it has to be that one of the remaining two obstructions is, has to be non-zero, the other zero. I don't know which one is which. I would suspect that the, the very first one is non-trivial and the last one is the one that is trivial. But one can compute from the other cases. Namely, well, suppose that the, the classical obstruction theory, the, the classical uh, half invariant, namely this guy, is non-zero. And suppose that the attaching map is in the metastable range. If the attaching map is in the stable range, it would have to be a suspension. The cone would have to be a suspension, and TCF a suspension is clear what happens. But suppose it is just not far away from this being a stable map, possibly. It's just in the metastable range, which means that Q is in between, well, it passes this number, in, but it's not more than three times P minus one. Then in that case, well, there are two things. In this classical situation, you would have, just by the red computation, you don't compute the obstructions. You just compute this some other way and realize that it is maximum possible, and therefore the obstructions have to be non-trivial, and that's a conclusion. You have maximum possible TC. How, uh, but more of, hey. 
What happens in, when you are far from this initial st stage in the metastable range? Well, in that case, it turns out that the third and fourth obstruction, the very last two ones that I was missing, are just certain multiples, very nice, simple-minded multiples of either the classical Hoff invariant or its joint square. Joints are not difficult to see where they are, com they are coming from. The number, the multiple, comes from homological input. You can do actual homological calculations and decide what this is. But this is giving you actually homotopy information, which, uh, as, I said, as I'm trying to advertise, would be rather inaccessible through more classical processes. And in particular, you can describe um, cases where these uh, spaces, two cell complexes, are, have maximal possible TC, and get some cases where it has three, which are kind of uh, new. So this is the, basically, this is the end of um, the presentation of the general results, although I haven't said anything really concrete about how these things work. And depending on time, I would. Would you care to give another talk? So is there any question for Jesus?